second half of this morning session. Uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Marcus Kramer from Ulm, and uh, he'll be telling us, um, well, it's a long title, I won't read it to you now. <laughs> Please start. Okay, Th thanks anyway. <laughs> Uh, maybe I, I'll start with an apology, because as you can see from the second part of the title, this is going to be a very physics-y talk. But it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those examples of which we had so many in recent years, where really methods from quantum information theory had, have led to new insights, if you want, and shed new light on, on really fundamental physics questions. And, and this, this is one example of those. But I'll start with this barrier scene theorem, which is also something quite fundamental. As you can see, uh, <coughs> really now wh when I tell you what it is, so so you all so you all know the central limit theorem, of course, and let's say we're we're classical now, so in classical probability theory, so we have a sum of not two correlated, whatever that means, not two correlated um, random variables, and then you know that if you have if you have many of these, so if if the number of those random variables tends to infinity then uh, the cumulative uh, distribution um, tends to, to, to the Gaussian uh, cumulative di distribution, right? This is, this is just the, the classical central limit theorem. Now, what is the barrier scene theorem? Well, here from here, you cannot see how fast this actually tends to the Gaussian, but this is, this is what the barrier scene tells you, namely that for all x, you have this upper bound that it tends as one over root of the number of these random variables, it tends, it tends to the Gaussian distribution, okay? So that's the, that's the classical version. So the quantum version, um, to introduce it, I'll just tell you what's commonly understood under the term of central, quantum central limit theorems. Well, it's the following. Let's say we have a certain geometry. Let's say we have, we have a, a, a some, some sort of lattice with, with the notion of a distance. And let's say um, on these sides, we have, we have just qubits to keep it simple. Now again, we have a sum. Now it's, it's the sum of, of certain operators. What we assume about, about these is that they're local, meaning that H, uh, xi acts only on, on i and it's, ne it's k nearest neighbors. Okay, and also we assume that it's bounded and simply set the operator norm to one. Okay, so now if, if these xi are bounded and k local in this sense, well then you have this quantum central limit theorem which means that now you're looking at this cumulative probability distribution. As you can see, these, these are the eigenstates of this operator, of the sum of these individual ones. This is some state, so these are probabilities. If I sum them up to, if I sum all of those where these xk, these are the eigenvalues of this, of, of this operator. If I sum them up to x, these guys are probabilities and this becomes a cumulative probability distribution again. And then you can study whether this also tends to a Gaussian if, if n goes to infinity. And yes, indeed, that's the case under certain un, un, under the assumptions that I that I just I just mentioned, and under the assumption that rho is sufficiently clustering, meaning that two-point correlations decay sufficiently fast. Okay, as you can see, so th this this was this was in well late eighties, and then then there was another one in, in two thousand and four. So this is a decade ago, and, and actually not so much has happened um, with these quantum central limit theorems, maybe because they're, in a way, they're, they're lacking applications, I would say. But now if we, if we look at the barrier scene version of this, so if we try to quantify how fast this actually converges to the Gaussian, then we're gonna see that there's, there's a lot of applications to this, okay? Now the importance, one, one, one reason why, this, why you might see from this that this is important, if we say that this guy is a Hamiltonian, so a local Hamiltonian, and the state is the maximally mixed state, then, 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 then this difference basically is the density of states. So in, in this sense, that it tells you that the density of states should, should tend to a Gaussian. Okay. Now the barrier scene version of, of the, this quantum version of barrier scene, well, that's, that's the same as before. We try, to, we try to find out how fast does this tend to, to, to the Gaussian. Okay, just to, just to set the stage and, and make, make clear what the assumptions are. So the assumptions, again, these guys are local, only act on i and its nearest neighbors. We're on a cubic lattice for simplicity of capital M qubits. And then sufficiently clustering, what I mean by this is that these two-point correlations, they decay exponentially. L is the separation of these two operators, A and B. 
size the, the correlation length and we allow for prefactored at scales algebraic in the in the number of spins. And we want we want this to hold for any for any two operators A and B. Well then we can show almost the same as in the classical case. We only we have the classical case up to a logarithmic um, correction and that's up to this logarithmic correction that's 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 optimal. Okay, so this constant is for completeness it's down here, it's a bit of a mess, but the important thing, of course, is that this doesn't depend on, on, on the number of spins. Okay, um, well, maybe two seconds on the proof idea. So the main, the main ingredient, and that also holds for the quantum central limit itself, is this integral version that was derived by a scene, there's this integral bound that was derived by a scene in, in, in 45 already, is that this, this is upper bounded, so T, T is, so whenever a constant larger than zero, C1 is an absolute constant. And then you can see it, it depends on, on the difference of the characteristic function of the Gaussian and the characteristic function corresponding to the system under consideration. And, and this guy actually goes by many names. So it's a characteristic function in the classical sense. And again, if, if this, this operator X, if that's a Hamiltonian, then for pure states, you might recognize this as, as, as the Lorschmidt echo. And again, if, if rho is this particular state, namely the maximally mixed one, then this is the Fourier transform of the density of states. Okay, so, so studying this, this function, you know, is interesting in itself as some applications as well. So we need to bound this, and how, how one usually does this is you set up a differential equation for this phi, for this characteristic function, and then bound its derivative and well, the reason why I won't give you more details is because then it starts to become a mess. So um, this is, so this, this guy looks pretty innocent and then you take the derivative and then you expand in terms, you insert zeros, such that you end up with something where the individual terms that you can actually bound. And so, so this is a, this is a classical, the classical version of the barrier scene. We can take it over to the quantum case quite easily we can simply do the same thing. Um, I should mention that you know by now, of course, the field has evolved, and, and there's there's much more elegant proof of this classical barrier scene theorem. But I just wasn't wasn't able to take it over to the quantum case, so I had to go back to these. And and, and then in the quantum case, it looks like this. <laughs> these terms are are basically the same as before. The only way the, the only thing we have to do we have to sneak in some auxiliary operators to deal with the non commutativity. But that's 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 all I want to say about this. Let's you know, better idea is probably to to talk about applications of this, and and this is where we move towards the the equivalence of ensemble. So now <coughs> let's say this operator that we've been studying, let's say it's a Hamiltonian, it's a local Hamiltonian again acting only on on, on a bunch of na nearest neighbors. It's these these guys are, are locally bounded. We set them to one, and let's expand them in their energy eigenbasis. And now we, we're gonna study, for the rest of the talk, we're really gonna study the canonical states, the Gibbs state or the thermal state um, at temperature T, where this is the, you know, the usual partition function. Then we also need some more notation. We need the energy density, which corresponds to the, to the first um, moment that we had in the barrier scene before. We need the specific heat capacity that corresponds to the second moment of what we had before and we assume that this, this thermal state, this Gibbs state, has finite correlation length in, in the sense, as I said before, such that we can actually apply the barrier scene. Now we know that this holds already since 69 for one-dimensional systems. It always holds that this Gibbs state is gonna, gonna have exponentially decaying correlations always. In higher dimensions, that, that's only true um, above a certain critical temperature. Okay, so when, whenever, I, when, when all the thermal states that I'm gonna talk about, they, they, they're gonna be such that they have, so I'm gonna assume that they have these exponentially decaying correlations. So in other words, that in higher dimensions we're above a certain critical temperature. Can you just describe the thermal value of the heat density Well, it might be algebraic then. Okay. That in certain sense that might also be sufficient, <laughs> but let's, let's keep it simple. Um, a bit more notation. So this is moving towards the microcanonical ensemble now. 
for this, we need to we need to define certain wave factors k. So these are the ones that label the, the these are the eigen the eigenstate of, of of the Hamiltonian, and we collect them in a set such that they are centered around a certain mean energy, <coughs> and the energy spread is some delta times square root of n. Okay, and we collect all of those k's in this set. Okay, now a direct application of the various theme is the following. So if we have a state rho on a on the subspace spanned by these guys, then if the energy is sufficiently close to the to the mean energy of the Gibbs state. Sufficiently close, meaning order one over root n, so there's some wiggle room there, doesn't have to be equal. And if delta, so the energy spread, smaller than a constant and larger than log n over root n. <coughs> okay. Then also I'm gonna, for the rest of the talk, fix these two conditions and say that I want this to hold. Whenever I, whenever you see an e and a delta, then 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 they are like this. Okay. Now when we have these assumptions, then we can say something about the distance of the state in terms of the relative entropy. So the relative entropy of this state from the subspace spanned by these k that obey these conditions is small in this sense. Okay, let's just look at the special case. There would be the microcanonical state, so, so, so projector on this subspace. Then its entropy is actually the log of the cardinality of the set, so this term is zero. So then the distance between these two states is of order log n to the twice the dimension. Okay. So that's one ingredient that we're gonna need for the equivalence of ensembles. And here's the here's here's the question. So this is I guess if you want that's the the, the motivational slide for 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 the rest of the talk is so we have this thermal state as before, and now the question is, we are on a, on a lattice, we look at a, uh, at a subregion C of edge length L in this lattice, and now we ask, which states are locally equivalent to the thermal state? So in other words, I have this thermal state that obeys these conditions. When is the reduction of the thermal state close to a state? So which, which conditions does this row have to fulfill such that locally, they look the same. Okay. Now for the microcanonical versus canonical state, th this is of course, you know, this is a very old question. It goes goes all the way back to Boltzmann and Gibbs. And well, the you know, the mo most results actually that you can find they are in the thermodynamic limit obtained via thermodynamical functions. I'm just gonna throw these names at you. And but say some more words on this. So for, for this for the setting that we're looking here at here is so we're looking at states where we're actually comparing the two states. This is something that has been looked at in 2013, two years ago. And actually um, the results that I'm gonna show you, many of those are a finite size version of what you can find in this paper. So yeah, I already mentioned it. So what, we, what we're trying to do here is that we wanna, we wanna set up bounds for, for, for finite size. So we don't send the number of qubits to the number of sites to, to infinity. Um, we, we're gonna consider more general states than the microcanonical states. I mentioned this wiggle room in the, in the mean energy before. So that's gonna give us an equivalence of a, of a, whole, of a whole class of microcanonical states if you want. And also we don't need to confine ourselves to translation and invariant systems. So this means the following. So say, I have an ex say you see an expression like this. So they are small, root epsilon. Then this is the translational invariant version. And if the system is non-translational invariant, then what we can say is that the same bound holds for the expectation over all cubic regions of edge length L. Okay, so w w whenever you see expressions like this and want to think about non-translation invariance, then think these bounds hold for the expectation of all cubic regions of edge length L. Okay, so here's the first result. So the distance between the two is going to be smaller than seven times square root of epsilon. So they are equivalent on, on a region of edge length L if this row is the microcanonical state with mean energy as before, 
and energy spread as before. And L has to be, well, has to fulfill this inequality, which basically tells you that L can be as large as n to the one over dim dimension plus two over log n. Okay, so it's not like maybe what one could have expected is that you have to fix this L, but it can actually grow with the number of, with the number of size, with the number of qubits. Okay, so whenever, whenever this holds, then evaluating averages in, in the microcanonical ensemble or canonical ensemble, they, they give you the same answer up to epsilon. One thing I should mention for the experts, maybe what, what would you have expected here? Well, you would think, so you, so you have your Gibbs state that has, that has the, the energy scales as, 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 as n, as capital N, because <coughs> we assumed the individual terms to be bounded by one, and, and the energy spread is basically root n. So you would have expected maybe that, that delta has to be you know, a constant in order for this to hold, but in fact, it can be much smaller. Uh, it just needs to, be, this energy spread just needs to be on the order of log n. Okay. A nice thing would be if one were able to show that this actually holds for arbitrarily small delta, because then you would have something that's called eigenstate thermalization, which means that it, in fact, every eigenstate of the Hamiltonian already looks thermal locally. Well, we don't have, qu have that quite, but well. One, now, now that we have this result, we can say more, just, just using this result for Popescu short in winter, which says that with high probability, actually, if I draw a pure state from this subspace, then with overwhelming probability, it will be, it will be the microcanonical state. Okay, so I draw, I draw a pure state from this from the subspace, if I look at it locally, then locally it looks like the microcanonical ensemble, so the projector on the subspace. Okay. So using barrier scene, we can we can further lower bound this probability. It looks like a mess, but the important thing is is that it's one minus e to the minus e to the system size. So it's doubly exponentially small. This expression, so so this with with very large probability. If the set is E delta and L, if they are as before, then with this very high probability, <coughs> these two guys look the same. And again, that's a constant basically. We have E to the minus N here. So, so you, you, you pick at random a state from this from the subspace and then with very high probability, locally it will look like the locally would look will look like the thermal state. Um, how do we get there? How do we prove this? Well, the main ingredient is is this result, and this is this is really where quantum information comes in, because all, all these all these ingredients they are really from the arsenal of, of, of quantum information, if you want. So what we show first is <coughs> if the relative entropy between some state rho and the thermal state, so that's the global one. It's really a global property. And the size of this subregion that we're looking at, if they fulfill this inequality, again, this is basically, they both have to be smaller than algebraic and n divided by log n. Then they are, they are, they are close to each other locally. So whenever you have, you have this relation, then the state rho will locally just look like the thermal state. So and once we have that, and we combine it with, with the lemma that we get from the barrier scene, then, then we, get, we get the result of, that you've seen on the, on the previous slide. Okay, what about other states? So we've talked about the microcanonical ensemble and random pure states from, from the subspace. Well, from this you can see that, well, that, that's you know, known, of course, that the mutual, uh, that the relative entropy between rho and the thermal state, that's, that's nothing but the difference of the free energies of the two. Okay, so if you plug this in there, then you see that all states that have sufficiently small, ener small free energy, they will locally look like a thermal state. Okay, so th this is another, you know, another set of states that we can 
add to the states that look locally thermal. So um, in a sense, this at this point, this is a sort of summary already. So um, if the thermal state at temperature T is non-critical in the sense that it has finite correlation at psi, then um, all states rho that fulfill either this condition or this one that we had before, they will look like thermal states locally. Okay, so again, we can, so either the free energy is, is small, note that this is always lower bounded by the free energy of the Gibbs state. Okay, so this, we have a lower bound here that holds for any state, namely that this is lower bounded by the free energy of the Gibbs state. It's well known that this is minimized by the Gibbs state. And if it's smaller than the free energy of the Gibbs state plus this factor, then locally it will look, it will look thermal. And under this, and if you know that it's in the subspace, course, in this microcanonical subspace, and you know the, uh, the, the, the entropy is sufficiently large, um, well then again, it will look thermal locally. And here, what's the upper bound on this? Well, obviously, because this guy is on, this, on the microcanonical subspace, this is upper bounded by the logarithm of the dimension of this subspace. And we have seen that, in fact, you know, almost all states from this subspace are locally thermal. Five minutes, then maybe some quick words on non-equilibrium um, situations. Because, of course, now we've seen that, in this sense, as seen before, that, that these two ensembles are, are equivalent locally. It doesn't answer the question, well, how, how do they emerge? And of course, say back in school, we learned that, you know, for in, in thermal equilibrium, then states are well described by, by the thermal state doesn't tell you, well, why, right? We just know that they are well described by, by, by the Gibbs state. Now one, now one way to look at this, to look at the emergence of, of, of those Gibbs states is, is non-equilibrium settings. So you start with a certain, you start with a certain initial state, um, you time evolve it by some Hamiltonian, and then you ask whether after a long time this state will thermalize in a certain sense. And again, this can only work if you restrict yourself to a subregion. So this is really the setting of you know, a system and an environment, if you want. And then what, what was shown in 2008 is that if you look at the long time limit, and if the long time limit of this guy exists, <coughs> then it has to be equal um, to this equilibrium state which, if you assume this non-degenerate energy gaps technical assumption, um, is this ensemble. So it's diagonal in the energy basis, and, and, and the coefficients are given by the overlap of the initial state with, with the energy eigenstates. Okay, then what these guys derived in 2008 is that um, if you average the trace distance of the two, the local versions of the two, so there should be a C <coughs> down there, so this is the local version of the, if you trace out the environment, everything but C, and then look at the trace dis distance of this local time evolved state and this equilibrium state, then this is small in, in, in this sense where this is just the dimension of this region that we're looking at, and this is basically the purity of, of the equilibrium state. Now, of course, to evaluate this for a given for a given initial state and a given Hamiltonian is not an easy task because it means you, you need to know the eigenstates and you need to know the overlap with the initial state. Okay, nice, nice thing again, we can use the barrier scene again to actually make this more explicit. Again, if the Hamiltonian is as before and if the initial state fulfills the, the barrier scene assumptions, namely it has exponentially decaying correlations, then we can, can bound this by a constant that can be evaluated you know, straightforwardly this, of course, is, is how it scales in the system size. It goes down algebraically in N. And this constant basically just depends on the energy variance of the initial state. So for a given Hamiltonian and a given initial state, that's something that can, can be evaluated easily. Okay, and then this doesn't answer, this doesn't answer the question whether this, whether this state is actually thermal. It just tells you that for most times, um, locally, the state will be close to the local version of locally will look like 
this equilibrium state. Doesn't answer the question whether this equilibrium state actually is close, is locally close to a thermostat. But then what we do, well, we use, we, we one could try to just very, well, just <laughs> to verify, to verify the conditions that we gave for the local equivalence. If they hold, well, then you know, this is the bound from before. This is the seven epsilon that you've seen before as well. So if this equilibrium state fulfills one of these two conditions if that you've seen before, then if you take an initial state, you evolve it in time, in the sense of have a quantum crunch, you wait for a long time, then for most of those times, locally the state will look like the thermal state. Okay, and I just put this there again and leave this as my summary and thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, yes, uh, any questions? Okay, so you, you mentioned, um, I mean, you're talking about how things become thermal. Do you have any, um, anything to say about sort of how fast this process is? Ah, that's of course, that's a very important, and very open question, I would say. Um, so there's some work by, by, by Tony Short where he, where he puts a bound on this time scale, but this involves these energy gaps. So this, this will be a very pessimistic bound. So this is really, a really, you know, question that's that's still out there. There are some there are some systems where like if you if you if you pick Hamiltonians at random, then you can say something about time scales, but that's a very unphysical situation. Okay, so no, that's that's very much open. It would be an important question obviously. Okay. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions at the moment. So uh, yes, let's uh, say thank you again.